Father in heaven, that is our prayer. Our prayer is that your kingdom would come. And that your kingdom would come in the full force and the weight and the authority of your son. And Lord, as we remember him today, we pray that you would use this time to enable us to see him rightly, to see him well, so that we could anticipate him, we could yearn for him, we could long for him, and we could declare him to the world around us. So we pray for your help, we pray for your grace towards that end, and we pray it in his name. Amen. Well, this is the point in our service where we take some time to remember Jesus around his table. It's the time for Christians to remember the person of Jesus and the work that he performed in their place at the cross. We'll be taking a bit of juice and a small wafer as symbols of the blood and the body of Christ. And to remember Jesus well today and to remember him rightly, we're going to be looking at a passage that identifies Jesus and his true identity as the Son of God. So if you have your Bibles with you, would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 27? We're going to be looking at verses 41 and 42 together. We have some men here coming down the aisles. If you don't actually have a Bible, just raise your hands and they'll get one to you. If you don't own a copy of God's word for yourself, please consider this our gift to you so that you can begin reading God's word for yourself. The setting here is that Jesus has been crucified on the cross and that he is surrounded by four groups of people. And Matthew uses the words and the actions of these people to reveal Jesus' true identity, to help us see who he truly is. First group of people that Matthew identifies are the soldiers who actually crucified Jesus. We see that in verse 34. They demonstrate their ignorance of who Jesus really is by after crucifying him, they just sit down to keep watch over him. To them, crucifying Jesus was no different than crucifying anybody else. They had no idea of who he really was. Roman crucifixions were conducted along the sides of well-traveled roads. And there were many people traveling the road that day. And there were people passing Jesus by as he hung on that cross. Many of these people misunderstood Jesus' prediction about his own death and resurrection to refer to Jesus himself destroying the actual temple in Jerusalem and rebuilding it in three days. So when they saw him hanging on the cross, apparently defeated towards that end, what came most naturally to them was to scorn him and to revile him as they were passing by. Then there were the robbers who were on the cross with Jesus, one on his left and one on his right. These would rob by force those who were traveling on these roads. These men were probably Jews. They probably understood something about Jesus' claims and his miracles, but seeing him on the cross in the same predicament that they found themselves in, at the end of our passage, we see that they were insulting Jesus with the same words as everybody else. But the focus of our passage today is on the religious leaders who were there. These are the men who knew the scriptures better than anybody else. These are the men who knew God's promises to reconcile sinful man to himself through one atoning, perfect, sinless sacrifice. And these are the men who watched with their own eyes as Jesus fulfilled these promises right in front of them. So let's read verses 41 and 42 together. And as we do, let's notice the condition that they place on Jesus, ostensibly in order that they would believe in him. Starting at 41. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. You see the requirement they place on Jesus at the second half of verse 42. With absolute insincerity, they say to Jesus, if you really are the king of Israel, if you really are the son of God, then prove it to us by coming down from that cross. We will believe in you only if you accommodate our understanding of who we think you really are. But what they were doing was they were refusing to believe the explanation of their own Old Testament scriptures and the explanation that they give of who Jesus really is and who the Messiah really is as a suffering servant. And read one verse from Isaiah 53, a verse that these men knew very well, a verse that they refused to believe. 53, five, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. 
and by his scourging we are healed. The piercing, the crushing, the chastening, the scourging, these describe the outpouring of God's avenging wrath on the one innocent substitute. So at the very same time that the religious leaders were denying Jesus' identity as the Son of God, by remaining on that cross, Jesus was proving himself to be the Son of God. He proved himself to be the Son of God by doing what the Redeemer must do and what is required of the Redeemer. And that is to give his life as a sinless atoning sacrifice for all of those who would trust in him as their savior. He absorbed within his own body the full weight of the Father's wrath against everyone who would place their trust in him. Think about that for a minute. Think about the magnitude of the offense that one sin is against a holy God. Then think about the wrath of that holy God in response to that one single sin. And then consider the number of sins that a person lays up against God in their lifetime. And then consider the vast number of people for whom Jesus died. That is the measure of wrath that Jesus satisfied as the propitiation for our sins. And he did all of that in the span of six hours. No created being, no mere man could accomplish this. Only the Son of God could accomplish this. Jesus' deity, Jesus' identity as the Son of God is the only reason that he could bring to an end the Father's wrath against those people in a period of time. So that's how we want to remember Jesus today, the one who, because he was the Son of God, accomplished our salvation by bringing to an end his Father's wrath against us. The men will be coming in a minute with the elements. If you understand Jesus the same way scripture describes him as the one who gave his life as an atoning sacrifice to redeem sinners away from the penalty of their sin. And if your life bears the evidence that you are living under his lordship, then please join us today. Christian, when the elements come to you, ponder the identity of your savior, ponder that he truly is the son of God, Thank him for his willingness to do for you what you could not do for yourself, to bring to an end God's wrath against you. And then when you're prepared, your heart is prepared, take the elements on your own. If you're here today and your testimony is that Jesus is not your Lord, he is not your master, we want you to know, the leadership of this church wants you to know that we're very thankful that you're here today. But we also want you to know that your sin remains an offense against the God who created you and one day he will avenge himself against that offense. And it will take you an eternity in a lake of fire to satisfy that wrath. But today could be a day of salvation for you if you will look away from yourself. If you'll humbly submit to Jesus' lordship over your life and trust him and believe in him to lead you for what he said he would do. God is faithful to forgive your debt of sin and to spare you from his wrath. I'll be available after the service at the info table in the front. Others are available too. If you have any questions, any of us would love to talk to you about what it looks like to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. So men, come and serve us. I'll close our time in prayer.